Happy Sabbath, kids. Welcome. Tell a child, tell the world. Tell the world, tell a child. Let's close our eyes as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the story that we are about to receive. May your Holy Spirit be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our story for today is about Balaam's talking donkey. Our memory verse is from John 14, verse 23. It says, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Balak, the king of Moab, didn't have any hope against his army. He remembered what was said of Balaam. Some said that whatever Balaam blessed was truly blessed. And whatever he cursed, was truly cursed. If Balak could get Balaam to curse Israelites, his army might have a chance. So he sent messengers to bring Balaam to him. They took along a lot of money. Balaam believed in God. He had once been a prophet, but he had become greedy and no longer served God. Yet when the messengers came, Balaam asked God for instructions. The answer came back, do not go with them, Balaam. You must not put a curse on my people because I have blessed them. So Balaam sent them home. But King Balak sent more messengers with more money. Balaam knew that God did not want him to go. But God knew that Balaam really wanted to go. So that night, God said to Balaam, Go, 
but only do what I tell you. So Balaam settled his donkey and went with the messengers. Balaam did not see the angel standing in the road to block his way, but his donkey did. So the donkey turned off into the field. And Balaam bids the donkey to get back onto the road. The angel appeared the second time. And the donkey moved against the wall, smashing Balaam's foot. And Balaam hit the donkey the second time. The third time, the angel appeared. There was no place for the donkey to go to. She laid down on the road. It was after the third beating that the Lord made the donkey to speak. What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? The donkey asked Balaam. Balaam was so angry that he answered without thinking. You have made a fool out of me, he said. You have ridden me for years, the donkey responded. Have I ever done this before? And that's when Balaam saw the angel. If your donkey did not turn from me, I would have killed you by now, the angel said. Balaam's life was saved by his donkey. I have sinned, Balaam said to the angel. If I am wrong, I will go back. The angel said, go, but you'll be able to say what the Lord wants you to say. When Balaam finally meets King, ba King Balaam, he warned him, I can only say what the Lord wants me to say. In three different places that day, King Balak asked, King ba asked Balaam to bless, to curse the Israelites. Every time Balaam opened his mouth, blessings for the Israelites came out. After a third time, the king was so angry. Go home, go home, go home, he ordered. I called you to curse my enemies, but you have blessed them three times. Didn't I tell you I couldn't do anything against the command of the Lord? Balaam answered. God told Balaam that worship involves everything you do. Listening to God. Listening to God's voice and follow God's instructions, just like Balaam did. There's someone always by your side Reaching out to you His name is J-E-S-U-S His promises are true He wants to teach you how to live Show you how to play He knows you will be happy If you follow Him today Come meet Jesus Come meet Jesus He wants to be your friend on him you can depend come meet jesus come meet jesus he wants to be your friend on him special friend there's someone always by your side reaching out to you his name is j-e-s-u-s his promises are true he came and lived and died for you to show his father's love so you can live eternally with him in heaven above come meet jesus come meet jesus he wants to be your friend on him you can depend come meet jesus come meet jesus he wants to be your friend, a very special friend. He's always your best friend. Amen. Let's close our eyes. We thank you, Lord.
that you are our best friend at all times and we even thank you lord for you showing us your instructions may we open our ears so that we may hear your instructions and may we listen to your voice when you want to speak to us please dear lord help us help us and bless us in jesus name we pray amen Great God's Church this morning in the name of our soon coming King Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, our offertory reading is found in a chapter and verse or a couple of verses 
that we are very well conversant with and uh, I want to read a bit more broadly uh, in this text so let's take our Bibles to the book of Malachi chapter 3 verses uh, 7 to 14 that is the book of Malachi chapter 3 verse 7 to 14 uh, it says uh, as a title in my Bible the importance of tithing uh, verse 7 reads, Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, said the Lord of hosts. But he said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. Uh, but he say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for uh, ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open uh, you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now verse 11 reads, uh, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, said the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, said the Lord of hosts. Your words have been stout against me, said the Lord, yet ye say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that he have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? The Lord always adds a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Uh, the interesting uh, thing in this in this in this couple of verses, even though we know them so well, is that uh, we often miss the fuller context about what God is actually complaining about. To the house of Israel. Uh, God is not just talking about tithing and offering, even though that's very important in this context. Uh, we see that it's important because he tells us uh, why it's important for us to return tithes and offerings, because so that there may be food in his house. That's why God wants us to return tithe and offering. But then in the rest of the in the rest of the passage, the complaint that God is making against the children of Israel is that they have abandoned him from the days of their fathers. They have turned their backs on him. They have they seek to rob him. And we see this uh, from verses 12 to verse 14, uh, where God charges them. Uh, with saying that they say it is vain to save God and what profit is it that we keep his ordinances. So they've even regarded serving God as vainsome and non-profitable. That is how badly their relationship with the God they serve has broken down. And part of the result and part of the evidence that the relationship they have with their God is broken down is that they have stopped returning tithe and offering. So tithe and offering, therefore, in this context is something that is part of the broader picture of the faithfulness that God requires from his people. But secondly, part of the broader picture of the sort of relationship that God wants to have with his people. The relationship has broken down and therefore they have stopped returning tithe and offering. The relationship has broken down and therefore they start to murmur and say it is vain to serve God and it's not profitable to worship him anymore. So the issue that Malachi is faced with is a people whose relationship with their God is in trouble. God is complaining and God is speaking to the children of Israel, trying to bring them back to the sort of relationship that he wants to have with them. And tithe and offering is just part of that relationship. Once that relationship is fixed and uh, the, the, the breach has been repaired, then we shall return tithe and offering without a problem. 
Another important issue in God demanding tithe and offering which shows, really, that God does not totally depend upon our finances and funds is that we see the a similar story mentioned in the book of Haggai chapter 2 verse 8. So in Haggai chapter 2, uh, God is talking to the children of Israel about the promise of rebuilding the second temple in Jerusalem after they had been taken to exile. And he, he makes them promises about how, you know, uh, the glory of the later house will surpass the glory of uh, the former house. But what he, he says in, uh, in, 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 in verse 8 of Haggai chapter 2 is that the silver is mine as well as the gold. So in other words, in promising the rebuilding of the temple, God promises them that he is not short for funds, that the silver belongs belongs to him and the gold also belongs to him and as we see historically about how the children of Israel rebuilt the temple God did provide because the Medo-Persian kings who gave them permission to return to Jerusalem and rebuild also gave them the resources to rebuild the temple so God can even use pagan kings to to, to provide funding and provide strength for his mission to be accomplished and that just seeks to show that regardless of our position the silver is his and the gold is his so in god telling us and reminding us about the importance of tithes and offering we don't suppose that God is, you know, we are his last option and that without us, his work can never go anywhere. We are never, you know, uh, absolutely necessary in such a sense that God's work can never proceed without us. But then as we see in Malachi chapter 3, the issue of tithes and offering is a matter of, you know, faithfulness and it's a matter of a relationship between us and God. So God wants to, to heal the breach between us and him. In doing that, he tells us to return tithes and offerings. Along the way, our relationship, the more faithful we are, the more faithful we are in tithes and offering, the more faithful we are going to be in other things, the more faithful we are going to be generally in our relationship relationship with God and that's what God wants from us today and uh, as we close I just would hope that you would take this message to heart and remember that the silver is God's so is the gold but then we are asked to contribute to his work because it benefits us as well because the more we return tithes and offerings the more faithful we can be and the more wholesome a Christian body we each are going to contribute to the church. Um, may we close our eyes in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of the risen Christ, we come before you this morning and we thank you so much for the opportunity and invitation to be part of your work and contribute in tithes and offering. We know, dear Father God, that we are not uh, crucially necessary, but this is so that we also may learn how to be selfless, we may learn how to love, we may learn to do away with selfishness, we may learn to be better people and have a stronger relationship with you. Help us, dear Father, to be faithful as we return tithes and offerings, and please do give us the blessings that you have promised us. Above all things, bless us with your presence this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One.
beloved family and friends, it is good to be with you today. Before we begin, I would like to invite you to close your eyes with me. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for the opportunity to call upon your great and marvelous name. God, I pray now that you turn the soil of our hearts so that your word may find a resting place within us. For we pray this in the name of Jesus for thanksgiving. Amen. This morning I would like to draw your attention to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew chapter 9, and I will be reading from verse 36 to 38, and this is what the Word of God says. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were rest and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Verse 38 says, Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. May God bless the readers, the hearers, and also the doers of his holy word. The title of my message this morning is Through God's Eyes. Through God's Eyes. As I was growing up as a little boy, I used to play a game that not many young people play these days. The name of the game is called I Spy With My Little Eye. And the whole point of this game is to get the other person to see what it is that you are seeing. And in the text this morning, it says that Jesus saw the crowds. And here Jesus wants us to see what he saw. One thing that I've come to learn while preaching is that before I exegete a text, I need to exegete the people to whom I'll be preaching to. In other words, before a preacher breaks down a portion of scripture, before he analyzes the portion of scripture, he needs to analyze the people to whom he will be preaching to. He needs to take out his spiritual stethoscope and place it to the chest of his hearers and listen to their heartbeats. A preacher by the name of Michael Beckwith was once asked, how do you prepare for your sermons? And he simply responded by saying, I don't. I simply look at the people's faces and the message is written all over their faces. So here we have Jesus preaching around the city, around the Sea of Galilee, and he's ready to preach, inspire, and minister to the needs of the people. But then Jesus pauses and he looks around at the people. In Matthew chapter 9, there seems to be this sacred series of the Savior where he sees and then he speaks. Jesus never spoke to a person unless he saw a person. In the opening of, of Matthew chapter 9, the text says that some men brought a paralyzed man to Jesus. And the Bible says that when Jesus saw their faith, he said, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus doesn't speak until he sees a few verses later in chapter 9 the bible says that jesus saw a man named matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth and jesus said follow me jesus doesn't speak until he sees a few verses later a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years presses her way through the crowd and touches the hem of of, of, of jesus's garment and jesus turns around and he saw her and then he says to her Take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. Jesus doesn't speak until he sees. One verse later, Jesus walks into the house of the ruler's daughter and he sees the mourners. He sees the people making noise. He sees the mourners playing funeral music on their flutes. And then he says, get out. This girl is not dead for she she's only sleeping. Friends, Jesus doesn't speak until he sees. And in the text this morning, Jesus sees the crowd and he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You see, friends, if we are to be effective proclaimers of this gospel, we must learn how to do an autopsy on people's dilemmas. We need to dissect their anxieties and be there for them. We must learn how to, to dissect their dilemmas and we, we need to really, and I'm emphasizing this point, we really need to be there for people, especially now during the period of COVID-19. And 21 centuries later, Jesus is trying to play a cosmic game of I spy with my little eye. And he is trying to get his people, his church, to see what he saw. 
This morning you may ask, well, what did Jesus see? When Jesus looked at the crowd, I imagined him seeing his people being unfairly taxed. He saw people being abused and betrayed by the elite. He saw disciples who were timid and nervous. He saw sick people, rich people, poor people, mixed people, kind people, depressed people, lonely people, disturbed people, angry people, proud people. Jesus saw the people. He saw uneducated people. He saw smart people. He saw gay people. Jesus saw straight people. He saw mothers with no child support and children without any dreams. Jesus saw the people. Although this morning, on the 26th of March, 2021, we are far removed from the mountains of Capernaum, where this scene took place. Jesus, even today, is trying to play a cosmic game of I spy with my little eye, trying to get his church to see what he saw. You see, friends, it is the name Christian that gives us the title, but it is the practice of Jesus that gives us the authenticity. So what do we see this morning? And I'm going to be real with you, friends. We are past the stage of preaching diluted sermons. We are past the stage of beating around the bush. Some of us can't see the people because we are looking for popularity. Some of us can't see the people because we are looking for prestige. Some of us can't see the people because we are looking for posts in the church. Could it be that some of us love crowds more than we love people, preventing the work of God from moving forward? When we see people in this world, friends, something should happen within us. When Jesus saw the crowd, something happened within him. When we see people, something should happen within us. We should feel punched in the stomach. The Bible says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Now the word compassion suggests that the bowels inside of Jesus began to move. The word compassion means that you can emphasize and sympathize deeply with another person. You should feel punched in the stomach. You, you see, friends, when Jesus saw the crowd, he felt punched in the stomach. If you have a sure connection to Jesus Christ this morning, my dear friends, and to that, to other humans, you should feel punched in the stomach when you see people dying of COVID-19. When I look at the number of COVID-19 deaths to date, I feel punched in the stomach. When I see people being murdered for the color of their skin, I feel punched in the stomach. When I see young men and women losing their lives, I feel punched in the stomach. When I see women and children being abused and raped, I feel punched in the stomach. When I see some people in the church fleecing the sheep instead of feeding the sheep, I feel punched in the stomach. When I see some ministers call for an offering before they offer Christ, I feel punched in the stomach. Friends, when we see people in this world, we have to see them through God's eyes. We need to foresee potential. Jesus looks at the people and they are helpless, defenseless, senseless, and also aimless. And in the text, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The people were like sheep without a shepherd. Now how can Jesus call people shepherdless, helpless, senseless, defenseless, and also aimless? Here Jesus connects an agricultural analogy to show that it is possible to find potential in broken people. Jesus says, I did not call them sheep because of what I wanted to take from them. I called them sheep because of who I wanted to be for them. Friends, Jesus saw potential. It was Aristotle who raises the notion of potentiality versus actuality. Potentiality is the possibility of a thing to become. Actuality is where a thing is. When you take a little acorn, it is just a little nut. It has the potential of becoming a mighty oak tree. But if you crush an acorn because you thought it was worthless, you also crush its potential of becoming an oak tree in the future. Friends, 
We have to be careful of who we crush today. Even Christians do it. Crushing the spirits of fellow believers. The person you crush today might be the person who provides you with shade tomorrow. Friends, we have to see potential in people just as Jesus saw potential. You see, friends, it was the God in Jesus Christ that allowed him to see for potential in people. And I must point out this morning that the way Jesus sees things and the way we see things is not the same. I mean, Jesus called sheep a harvest. Jesus called Judas friend. Jesus called a criminal on the cross saved. Jesus called lepers healed. God foresees potential in us despite of us. Yes, friends, we are not only called to foresee potential. We are also called to free people. Jesus looks at the crowd and he says the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. Beloved, are we willing to lay down our sinful natures to take care for the people we see around us? Martin Luther was assassinated because his eyes met an issue in the church. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was killed because his eyes met an injustice on his people. And this morning, you may feel that you cannot be used by God because of the life you have lived and because of the decisions you have been making. In the words of Paul Tinch, whose voice echoes through the ages, he reminds us that the courage to be is to accept yourself although you are unacceptable. He also says that we need to accept our unacceptable selves and come to the consciousness that we are incompletely complete. I want you this morning to take a trip with me inside of your brain, past the temporal lobe where your long-term memory is stored, stored in your hippocampus, and just imagine with me this morning what is in your closet. Winter is fast approaching. Perhaps you have clothes in your cupboard that you haven't worn since the winter of 2015. Yes, friends, we need to bless the least, the lost, the lonely, and also the left out. The harvest is great, but the laborers a few. We as a people, we as a church, need to come to a point where we love freely and give without expecting anything in return. Yes, we may be incompletely complete, but God has a special work for us to do, and the desire needs to come from within. A great Jewish leader calls it the duties of the limb versus the duties of the heart. You see, the duties of the limb is what we do, but the duties of the heart is who we are. We first need to ask God to change our hearts so that we may see people through God's eyes. If we go through the Bible, God gave men and women ordinary gifts to do his work. They were incompletely complete. David had five smooth stones, yet he killed Goliath. Moses only had a rod, yet he split the Red Sea. The three young Hebrew boys had only the belief, yet they came out of the fiery furnace. Daniel had only faith, yet he survived the lion's den. Nehemiah had only a letter from King Artaxerxes, yet he rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. Yes, friends, I am just reminding you this morning that you have to work with what God has given you, even though you are incompletely complete. John the Baptist had only a voice in the wilderness, yet he prepared the stage for the true uh, star to shine. Friends, Mary had only a virgin womb, yet she carried the one who would soon carry her. Peter had only a little courage, yet he walked on water. Jesus had two nails in his hands, a crown of thorns on his head, and a spear in his side, yet he saved the world. Christ had a mission. Yes, friends. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. This mission will succeed because we are fighting alongside one who knows no failure. To conclude, in the United States, they have a special force called the para-rescue men. These are highly trained men who rescue and recover soldiers in the camp of the enemy. They save soldiers who cannot save themselves. They bring soldiers home to fight another day. And the creed of the para-rescuement reads as follows. 
It is my duty as a pararescueman to save lives and to aid the injured. I will be prepared at all times to perform my assigned duties quickly and efficiently, placing these duties before personal desires and comforts. And it says, these things I do that others may know. These things I do that others may know. People may ask you why you do what you do, but say to them, my dear friends, these things I do that others may know. Why do you care for the needy? They may ask, but say to them, these things I do that others may love. Last night I asked Jesus why he left eternity to come to time. And he said to me, these things I do that others may love. I asked him why he died on the cross to save a sinner like me. And he said to me, these things I do that others may love. Yes, friends. Do you do things that others may love? If your eyes are always on the people, then whose eyes are on you? The song says, Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus, when Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the blue jay. His eye is on the robin. His eye is on the eagle. And his eye is on the sparrow. And I know this morning that he is watching over you and me. May God bless you as we turn our attention from crowds to people. Seeing people through God's eye. Dear God, we thank you for this Holy Sabbath day. We thank you that we could spend time with you, God. We pray this morning, God, that you give us the spiritual eyesight to see people through the eyes of God so that we may be congruent of blessing. Lord, help us to be ready for your coming and help us to get others ready for your soon coming. For we pray this in the name of Jesus with thanksgiving. Amen. Linda, 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 Linda.